A fake band toured the U.S. with a hit song in 1969. You probably know the song, but you don't know the story of the zombies on a brand new episode of The Internet Says It's True. Hey! Welcome, welcome back to The Internet Says It's True, where every week we learn something that sounds made up, but it's really true. Part of the WCBE podcast experience. My name's Michael Kent. This is episode 100 and... 90. Thank you so much for giving me a few weeks off from the podcast. I appreciate all the support and understanding. And if you want first crack at listening to every episode and you want to hear them without all the ads, you can do that by joining the Patreon. Uh, that's super easy to do. You should go do that. Uh, you can sign up for a free trial, patreon.com slash Michael Kent. Just type in my name, patreon.com slash Michael Kent. That's the best way. If you want to show your support of this podcast, it helps me uh, keep going. As you know, keeping this going among my other projects takes a lot of time and effort even a little bit of money so your support by becoming a tizzler is just huge keeps the ship moving uh once again that's patreon.com slash michael kent that's the place to go for that and you can join at any level if you ever want to see magic shows i do on the road but you don't want to leave home and buy a ticket if you just join at the top level that's ten dollars a month you get access to all of those shows in their entirety. But you don't have to join at that level. You can join at $1, whatever you want. There's even a free trial. It's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. I am once again asking for your financial support. So this week's story is a great one. And there are so many side roads that I could go down with this story. We'll explore some of that. But for now, let's get on with it. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Back in 2003, I performed a magic show at a chili cook-off up near Cleveland, and my job was opening for the Drifters. That's the band that sang Under the Boardwalk, Only You, and a dozen other recognizable doo-wop hits from the 50s. Except it wasn't the Drifters. It was one Drifter and a bunch of musicians he hired to fill in for the other guys. There were at least three other Drifters splinter groups doing the same thing, touring the country, playing these old songs after the original band broke up. And there's a similar story about The Animals. That's the band that made famous uh, the song The House of the Rising Sun, and C.C. Ryder, and Don't Bring Me Down. They achieved their fame after the band broke up. So the lead singer, Eric Burden, put together a new band, called them The Animals, and toured. So it was sort of a fake band, but sort of not. And there are a whole host of fake bands that achieved fame throughout time. One of the most famous was, of course, The Monkees, who started out as a sort of fake band to go along with a comedy television show. But then they actually became a real band. The Monkees were all real musicians when they were cast for the show. They weren't all great musicians, but they could at least sing, which is what they did uh, for their first few hits, and all they did on those first few hits. Over time, they eventually started writing and recording their own songs themselves and playing all the instruments. And then there's the only fake band to reach number one on the Billboard chart, the Archies. When this cartoon band with Archie, Jughead, Betty, and Veronica hit number one with Sugar Sugar, they were all billed as the Archies, but not the original musicians' names, which were Ron Dante, Tony Wine, and a whole host of studio musicians. Interestingly, Ron Dante did tour as Ron Dante and the Archies for a while, however. Today's story starts with a very real band, the Zombies. The Zombies were originally called the Mustangs, but the members, Rod Argent, Paul Atkinson, Hugh Grundy, Colin Blunstone, and Paul Arnold, realized that several other popular bands were going by that name, so Arnold came up with the name Zombies, because at the time, zombies weren't everywhere in pop culture like they are now. It was an obscure reference at the time, and no one else would have that band name. Arnold left the band right after that, but his mark on the band stayed. They were the Zombies, and they broke out in the mid-60s with a few huge hits like Tell Her No and She's Not There. She's Not There sold a million copies, made them a hit in the UK. They actually landed their first contract with it after winning 250 pounds in a local contest. They were signed to Decca Records, and the song made it to number 12 on the UK charts. When it made it overseas, it climbed to number 2 in the US. And their fame allowed them to travel to the US and tour with their new hit songs in 1965. They toured throughout the states and even had a run in Brooklyn, performing as part of Murray the K's Christmas shows at the Fox Theatre, where they performed seven shows a day. They returned to the UK and continued writing and recording songs, but despite their success with those first few singles, 
nothing they were writing was gaining any traction, and it was a huge low for the band who had just recently been in the United States living the dream performing for full audiences full of screaming teenagers. In 1967, they were signed by CBS Records and recorded their next LP at Abbey Road Studios. And yes, it was that Abbey Road Studios. In fact, the Mellotron used on this new album was the one left there by John Lennon after it was used on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This new album was named Odyssey and Oracle, with the word Odyssey famously misspelled by mistake. The album had a couple great tracks on it. One of them was called Care of Cell 44, which is, which is this strange, upbeat song about waiting for a lover to be released from jail. It never charted, but the members have said that they always thought it should have. The other hit song from the album is one you've likely heard. It's the time of the season. Time of the season was a unique song. There's hardly any chorus to this song other than there's one line repeated three times throughout the song, but the opening groove and the bass line is infectious. And despite the song being sort of an earworm, it still didn't blow up the radios in the UK. The song never charted in their home country. It was re-released as a single in 1968, and it wasn't until the following year, in 1969, that the song absolutely exploded in the US, rising all the way to number three on the Hot 100 and becoming forever this sort of anthem of the era of psychedelic rock. It was finally the sophomore success that the band had been hoping for. There was only one problem. The band had broken up two years earlier, just after recording Odyssey and Oracle. I'll tell you what happened next after a short break. The AI for Kids podcast is a new awesome podcast designed to help educate kids on the amazing world of artificial intelligence. Let's face it, they're going to grow up in a world filled with artificial intelligence. In the AI for Kids podcast, they tackle subjects like, how does your phone recognize your face? Or how video games can learn to become harder as you get better. AI can get a bad reputation in the news, but the truth is we've been living with it and benefiting from it for a while now. And the children of today are going to be using it and hearing all about it their whole lives. The AI for Kids podcast is a great place for them to start. And adults just might learn something too. Listen to interviews with experts, get your questions answered, and unlock the mysteries of artificial intelligence where playtime and learning collide. Go check out the AI for Kids podcast and subscribe wherever you're listening. We're living through the most dynamic time in human history, and what we do as leaders matter. We are the ones that create the leverage to shift directions of our companies, our nonprofits, and our communities. As a leader or an emerging leader, please join me for a dynamic conversation with top thought leaders, academics, and executives to learn more about how to elevate your leadership. I'm Maureen Metcalf. Join us at the WCBE podcast experience at wcbe.o. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing balms, but unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seemed to stop around the same time that animal fats stopped being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. If you love listening to this podcast every week and you want to show your support, that would mean a great deal to me. You can do that by becoming a Patreon member. We've got members at all levels, whether you want to pledge $1 a month or $10 a month. Just think about the value that you receive from this show. And if you like the histories and the stories that you learn about or the jokes that you hear, and if you think that they're worth it, consider signing up. For that, you get every episode ad-free and a week early, access to bonuses like the unedited videos of the guest appearances, and 20% off all merchandise. You can sign up today at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. Uh, it's the time of the 
time of the season was a huge hit in the U.S. in 1969, and young Americans were begging to see their new favorite band in person. But the band had broken up back in 1967. The lack of success following their first album had caused tension in the band, and they were sort of seeing a lack of demand for performance dates. The first three singles from the Odyssey and Oracle album had flopped. The lead singer, Colin Blundstone, got a job working in an insurance office. Rod Argent formed a new band with Chris White. The Zombies were no more. So when Time of the Season, the fourth single to be released from the album, made it big in the U.S., there was no band left to tour with it. It was released in the U.S. with the help of a man named Al Cooper. Cooper is a music legend. He's played on hundreds of records, including The Rolling Stones, B.B. King, The Who, Alice Cooper, and Jimi Hendrix. He's literally the guy that named the band Blood, Sweat, and Tears. If you've ever heard Bob Dylan's song, Like a Rolling Stone, that's Cooper playing the organ. He's literally the guy that produced the song Freebird. He was on vacation in England, and he'd bought the Odyssey and Oracle album and absolutely loved it. He was working in A&R for Columbia Records and convinced Clive Davis to release the album in America. Clive Davis had already heard the album and passed on it, but Cooper told him, quote, you'll be making a dreadful mistake by not picking it up. So he was right. Columbia released it and didn't promote it at all. The song was so unique and captured the sound of the country in 1969 that radio DJs fell in love with it. In fact, the members of the Zombies were completely unaware of the success of the song as it was happening. There was an obvious demand in the U.S. for a Zombies tour, but no band to do it. So in comes a company called Delta Promotions. Delta Promotions decided to cash in on the hit song's success by actually putting together two different bands to act as the Zombies. In 1969, this type of thing could happen because the time it took information to travel in a world before the internet. A band in Texas was put together with a young musician, 18-year-old Mark Ramsey, a guitarist, Seb Metter, from a band called The Gentleman, a drummer named Frank Beard, and a bassist named Dusty Hill. And if those last two names sound familiar, yes. Frank Beard and Dusty Hill would later go on to international fame as two of the three members of ZZ Top. But their first experience playing together was playing these zombie songs and passing themselves off as the zombies. It was, of course, incredibly unethical, but the members were told the whole thing was legal and that Delta Promotions had acquired the rights to the songs. It's pretty clear that's not true, but again, in the 1960s, this type of thing was easier to get away with. Other musicians that were involved claim they were told the zombies never existed. The whole thing was just a project released by studio musicians. A promo photo for the band shows them in cowboy hats, something that the real zombies would never be caught wearing. And at the bottom, you see the name, the original, The Zombies, with the band name The Zombies in quotes. Delta Promotions referred to them as the Texas Zombies because they had another fake zombies band from Michigan. That band was a five-piece band from Marquette in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and they had come together as a Beach Boys-inspired band. But for the Zombies promo photos, they put on paisley-looking, psychedelic clothing that matched the sound of the Zombies. This band was actually really talented, while the Texas Zombies didn't have quite as much success. So there's a story that one night, while the Northern Zombies were playing the Whiskey A Go-Go in Los Angeles, some friends of actual Zombies member Paul Atkinson were there. They got the act on tape, and this part is crazy. Delta Promotions knew the band didn't sound the same as the album, and the way they excused it was they would tell the audience that some of the band members had changed, but they claimed the band had one original member. So on this recording that was secretly recorded, they've got one of the members of this band from Michigan speaking into the microphone between songs with this bad fake British accent and calling himself Hugh Grundy, actually stealing the name of one of the real Zombies members. They continued touring, but the evidence of the bands being fake kept growing and actually gained some press, most notably in Rolling Stone magazine. Then came the next problem for Delta Promotions. They were touring a fake band calling themselves The Animals. Earlier in the story, I told you how Eric Burden from The Animals had toured a, a band of all new musicians, but with him? Well, this wasn't that. This was a band made up of no one from The Animals, not even Burden. And the story goes on that Eric Burden got together a biker gang and went after the fake animals band. Between the fake animals incident and the fake zombies, Delta Promotions was on the ropes. 
but the lawsuit that ended up bringing them down was from another group I mentioned earlier in this podcast, the Archies. Delta Promotions was the group responsible for putting instruments in people's hands and having them tour as the Archies, a band that was made up of studio musicians. All of this came out in yet another Rolling Stone article, and that was pretty much the end of Delta Promotions. It was later, in 1969, the same year that the fake zombies from Texas were touring around this huge hit song, that they met up with a man named Billy Gibbons and formed ZZ Top. And as for the real zombies? Grundy, Blundstone, and White reunited in 1989 without Rod Argent and released Return of the Zombies. Another decade later, Argent joined back up with the band and started playing together again. He had seen success on his own playing with Ringo Starr and releasing his own music, such as the hit song Hold Your Head Up. These days, the original members of the Zombies still get together to perform and were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2019. So next time you hear Time of the Season, put yourself in the shoes of a teenager watching the band live somewhere in the U.S., not knowing you were really watching the beginning of ZZ Top. The internet says it's true. It's time for Yap Yap with me and a friend. Today I'm calling comedy writer, author, and performer Jimmy Mack. Jimmy's the author of the book Daddy Shouldn't Break Dance. He's the head writer at Shadowbox Live here in Columbus, Ohio, and is a great friend of mine and has a killer vinyl collection. What's going on, man? How have you been? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you doing today? Good. Have you added anything to your vinyl collection recently? I'm sure oh, you yeah. have since yeah, I saw it, but... Yeah, um, I've added a bunch, actually. So my wife says we can never move again because the, the <laughs> records are just too heavy at this point. Um, but yeah, I just I just bought uh, Paul Simon's Rhythm of the Saints on the vinyl. And first time I've owned that, and it just sounds amazing. Which one is Rhythm of the Saints? It's the one that was right after Graceland. Oh, I don't think I have that one. It's great. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Is that... Wait, no. Graceland he did with um, Lady Smith... Uh, Mombasa, Black Mombasa, Black Mombasa. Right. yeah. Did were they on the next one as well? They are not. No, it's, but it it's still has like a, a, a world music feel to it. A lot of yeah. Brazilian uh, influences and things like that. Yeah, like the obvious child. I think was the radio friendly uh, song that came out of that one. Yeah, I don't know. Oh yeah, I know the obvious child. Yeah, that I, Graceland's probably the best one, right? I agree. Yeah. yeah, it's Graceland is so so good. Just musically, yeah. just a great album. Yeah, I've always um, said if I had to like just go to like you know the the question about being abandoned, uh, stranded on an island, and you had one one record, that would that would absolutely be the one I would take. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, for those of you who who don't know or haven't heard Jimmy before, Shadowbox Live is a sketch comedy and rock and roll theater in Columbus, Ohio, that does original work. Um, what four shows? Three different shows a week? How many different shows each week are you doing now? Well, we've just changed our schedule this year. So we okay. actually do one show from Thursday through Sunday um, for like seven weeks. And then we do another show Thursday through Sunday for seven weeks. So we do, you know, like five shows a year. Yeah. And and they're all original. Um, some of them are, you know, like jukebox musicals. And the thing that's a unique about Shadowbox is that everyone does everything. Um, the people that are serving your food, it is a dinner theater. The people that are serving your food are the same people that you see on stage, the same people that are playing in the band. Um, and the people that are backstage cooking the food are those people as well. It's sort of an all-in-one deal. Um, really, really cool. I've done a lot of work with them in the past. And uh, what's the latest? What's what's happening at Shadowbox? Uh, we have a sketch comedy show right now called Behind Closed Doors that I think, in all honesty, you know, and I've been doing this for a long time, I think maybe one of our best sketch comedy shows we've ever done. I'm I'm crazy proud of it. I think we've got some really, really funny stuff in there. That's awesome. This, this theater, a lot of people in Columbus – are amazed when they walk in because you don't expect something like this to be in a city that's not a tourist city. Um, it's over 300 seats in this beautiful room um, and uh, like full kitchen, full bar, all that stuff. It's it's yeah, really I mean, I'm incredible. the bartender because I write the jokes, so they also make me responsible to get you drunk enough to laugh at them, so it works yeah. out perfect. But that's also because you can't sing, and so they needed something else for you to do. <laughs> They can't be in the That's band. Awesome. Jimmy can't be in the band. Let's have him mix drinks. <laughs> Which is good because no one wants the band mixing drinks. They'll be too strong. That's right. Absolutely not. Uh, so th I've added a new thing now to to then this will be the first episode where we do this. 
rather okay. than just me coming up with something like, hey, did you know this weird fact? I want all my guests now to bring me one strange fact or interesting thing that they think maybe I didn't know, something they can stump me with. And uh, I will honestly answer. Honor, it's Scout's Honor, the, the what do you call it, the, the honor system. I'll answer whether or not that's something that I already knew. So do you have uh, some sort of topic? Yeah, so this is something that I read about a few years ago that I thought was interesting, and you like you may know it. Um, but did you know that McDonald's, uh, in an effort to try to get kids to eat healthier, actually came up with bubble gum flavored broccoli? No, that is, <laughs> you that have true. stumped me. They, yes. they, and this something they marketed and sold. They they put it together, they created it, and then they did a test uh, run with kids. And uh, it was decidedly turned down. So it never made it to the menu. <laughs> Did the kids learn that they were eating broccoli? The, the, the quote I read was they were very confused by the taste. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, I love that. No, I've never yeah. heard that. That's wonderful. But it's funny because you look at now and it's like, you know, meat is being replaced by cauliflower everywhere. Right, right. So maybe they need to try it again. Maybe the problem yeah, guess, was bubble gum. Maybe they needed to make it taste like chicken. I mean, like, I, I, I want to know who came up with the bubble gum idea. Like, you, like they say, what's the most opposite taste broccoli has? And, and someone said bubble gum. They said, we're doing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it was something like, what do kids like? And they <laughs> yeah, were like, right. uh, cotton candy flavored broccoli? <laughs> no. We'll I don't... save that for vaping. <laughs> is it the taste that turns kids away from broccoli? Or is it the fact that it's a vegetable? Uh, yeah, I think I think it's probably more vegetable based. Yeah, I mean, it is the most vegetable looking vegetable. So I That's think true. like it's not one of those it things like where you're eating a small tree, right? Yeah, you're eating like if you eat green beans, you can pretend they're French fries or something. But I, I think with a veg, it's like, yeah, you're, this is definitely a tree because it looks like a tree. <laughs> that is a great fact, man. Thank you for that. So let's get on yeah, with our, our, our topic this this week. Uh, for this question, we're going to play for a joke. So if you get it wrong, you got to tell me a joke. If you get it right, I will tell you a joke. Here is your question. After their hit song, Time of the Season, hit it big in 1969, the Zombies toured the U.S. with the hit. Why was that unusual? A, it was a cartoon band, and so their concerts were all in movie theaters. B, the band had broken up two years earlier and was replaced by a fake version. Or C, it was their only song. The rest of the show was just cover songs. I am going to guess B. B. The band had broken up? Yes. The answer is B. The band had broken up two years earlier. It was replaced by actually two different fake versions. Um, <laughs> really interesting stuff. So, like, you know, Time of the Season was a huge hit. It charted right. number three. And as we know, looking back, you know, that was 1969. And all this years later, that's still this, like, anthem of that era. And yep. just just the opening, do, 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 you know, that's like so you, you instantly picture Woodstock and, and that whole summer of love. Um, but the this was, I think, one of the most interesting parts of this story is that the and I want to make sure this isn't. Uh, da, 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 yeah, OK, I, I want, didn't want to spoil a future question. Um, one of the bands. That was the zombies had two members in it, Dusty Hill and Frank Beard. Frank Beard from ZZ Top and Dusty Hill from ZZ Top. Wow! Yeah, wow. two of the two of the three ZZ Top guys were a fake Zombies cover band. <laughs> I did not know that. That's amazing. Yeah, and and here's the interesting part: ZZ Top formed that same year, 1969. Wow! So yeah, really interesting. Like the time of the season may have had something to do with us knowing, you know, ZZ Top in some strange way. So. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, so you got it right. I owe you a joke. This is a stupid joke, but I feel like you'll love it. What did the drummer say when he left one classic rock band for another classic rock band? What? Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> See, I love that. That's that. People that's who fantastic. aren't big, don't know American classic rock are very confused right now. Those are both <laughs> Toto and Kansas are band names. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Toto, uh, maybe one of the best albums ever. Um, with uh, which one was it? A Asia. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, th yeah, I think in terms of sound quality, like maybe not the most interesting songs, but in terms of like, if there's a song 
that I want to test speakers with, that is what or that's the album I'm playing. It's Toto Asia. That's great. So, uh, okay, moving on. Uh, your one for one question two. We're playing for an admission of a guilty pleasure band or artist. Now, I've done this before, so if you get it right, I'm going to say the same thing that I did last time, but it's been so okay. long that the listeners don't remember what that <laughs> what that is anyway. One of the bands that acted as the zombies in the U.S. consisted of future ZZ Top members Dusty Hill and Frank Beard, as we just talked about. What was Billy Gibbons, the other member of ZZ Top, what was he up to at the time? Was he A, in a band called The Moving Sidewalks, B, in a band called The Night Mongoose, or C, a cashier at Burger King. Ooh. I'm going to go with A. I don't know how you got that right. That was a hard one. (laughs) The Moving Sidewalks was the band. They released an album called Flash, and that year they opened for Jimi Hendrix, uh, the Jimi Hendrix experience for like four dates. Oh, wow. So it wasn't, you know, they. I don't think they saw any huge commercial success, but that's a big deal, uh, at least, you know, music history. I listened to some of that album today, and it's pretty good. I enjoyed it. Okay. It's very Ooh, Billy I'll Gibbons. Check it out. Yeah, gravelly voice and stuff. Uh, you got it right. So my guilty pleasure band probably always will be the B-52s. Um, just, I can't not smile when I hear the B-52s. Well, you'd be uh, impressed to know that our closing song in Behind Closed Doors, the show that we're putting on right now, is indeed Love Shack. Is that right? Sung by, sung by uh, the incomparable David Whitehouse, as you can imagine. I bet that's really good. It's really fun. Yeah. Does he sing it as Fred Schneider? Pretty much. Yeah. That same style? Yes. I yeah. love that. I love that. You're selling this show on me. I'm going to have to come in. Please do. Let's be honest. I'm not leaving home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I, I complain all the time about like I, when I do shows in Columbus and like friends don't come and see my shows and then they're like, hey, there's a thing going on. I'm like, oh. No, I'm, no. <laughs> I'm exactly the same way. I, there's so much I want to do. And then I'm like, no, I'm home. That's <laughs> part like of being home. an adult. And I like <laughs> being social, I think, is super important. But like, it's so easy to isolate now more than yeah. ever. Uh, so, man, you're two for two. And uh, question three, we're going to play for a sticker. This is the Internet oh. says it's true. Orange sticker. If you're a listener and you want one of these, I will mail you one. If you join uh, the Patreon, you'll get one of those and not just that i'll send a couple of little fun things in the mail as well that's patreon.com slash michael kent um otherwise you have to see me on the street or you have to be on the podcast and win the the third question uh time of the season peaked at number three on the hot 100 in the u.s this was march 1969 what was the number one song in march of 1969 here are your your options dizzy by tommy rowe Love Will Keep Us Together by Captain and Tennille, or Tossin' and Turnin' by Bobby Lewis. Ooh. Yeah. What were the choices one more time? So, uh, yeah, number one was Dizzy by Tommy mm-hmm. Rowe. Uh, number two was uh, Love Will Keep Us Together. That's Captain and Tennille. And C, Tossin' and Turnin' by Bobby Lewis. I'm going to guess B. B, Love Will Keep Us Together. The answer was Dizzy by Tommy oh, okay. Bro. Um, and I know this song, but I didn't know it when I read that. And then I went and listened to it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know that. Um, you, do you know uh, just by hearing the name Dizzy? Do you, can you, I do. Yeah. Okay, I, know, okay. I know the song. Yeah. I, I did not know. Well, I, like I said, I knew the song, but not by the name Dizzy. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, that was. Um, oh, here's the rest of that top 10. Pretty interesting. So Dizzy was number one. Uh, Traces by Classics 4 featuring Dennis Yost. Don't know that one. That was number two. I uh, three was time of the season. Four was Aquarius. Let the sunshine in by the fifth dimension. Very sure. famous. Five also famous. Proud Mary by CCR. Uh, six runaway child running wild. That was the temptations. Uh, that's the rest of them. I don't know. So the uh, huh. rest of them. Number seven was Indian giver. That was 1910 fruit gum company. Never heard of the band. Never heard of the song. No. Um, isn't that amazing like these are i mean these are top 10 hits so yeah i uh when i drive into work on sundays i listen to they they play uh casey Kasem's uh american top 40 yeah, from the yeah, 80s, yeah and i always catch like the top five and i forget everything was like 85 or something and like number five was like you know and you hear like casey Kasem, he's like okay so number five on the american top 40 <laughs> is 
Naughty Girls Need Love Too by Samantha Fox. And I'm like, what is this song? How is this number five? Uh, can we, by the way, just take a minute and give it up for your Casey Kasem? It was really, really good. Uh, oh, thank you. That's, that's fantastic. Number eight was Galveston by Glenn Campbell. Um, nine was My Whole World Ended by David Ruffin. Don't know who that is. Don't know the song. And then uh, number 10 was Only the Strong Survive by Jerry Butler. Don't know the guy. Don't know the song. Don't know Isn't that that's well. crazy, right? And, I, and I, I consider myself a pretty good audiophile. And yeah, those are those right. stump me. Yeah. And I looked through the list just because I had it up. Um, and number 94 had this very obscure song called Good Times, Bad Times by Led Zeppelin. Uh, that was <laughs> number 94 in March of 1969. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there were a lot of really big hits really low on the list uh gotcha. kind of interesting but i guess a lot of songs are that way on their way up maybe you know maybe it had yeah, just yeah, been yeah. released so okay well anyway let's move on question four we're gonna play for um, by the way you do not get a sticker uh <laughs> question four we're gonna play for an admission of the first time we really got in trouble so i don't know if that's okay. something you can think back and remember um but like the sure. first yeah. time that you can remember getting in trouble whether it was at school or with your folks or whatever the keyboardist of the zombies, Rod Argent, played keys on another hit song in 1978. Which one was it? Was it A, Hopelessly Devoted to You by Olivia Newton-John, B, Miss You by the Rolling Stones, or C, Who Are You by the Who? I'm going to guess B. The answer, C, Who Are You by the Who? Huge, huge song. Um, I, I don't know Miss You by the Rolling Stones. Maybe I do, but... It was. I think I if looked, you heard it, you'd know it. Probably. Yeah. The, these are all songs that were around that same time. Um, but Argent was called in at the last minute to replace the session keyboardist, who was John Bundrick. Uh, he had suffered a broken arm falling out of a taxi, which just sounds so British. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so are they, they called like, taxis in, in, in over there? Is that? I think it's called a lift. Uh, that's that's the elevator. <laughs> Oh, you're right. It's uh, they're called braces, I think. Okay. They they refer to taxis as chips. Chips. In in yeah, uh, in in America, a chip is like a potato chip, but in right. if you say I would like fish and chips, it means that you're gonna eat fish and then take a taxi. I think. <laughs> I've never been to England. Um, <clears throat> I don't speak the language. <laughs> this is. No, I don't know what they call taxis. They probably call them taxis, right? I know that yeah, they're black, probably, right? Yeah, Aren't probably. they black? They're like those black old cars from like the yeah. 40s. Like yeah, the round. So. Yeah, I don't think they've ever upgraded. Yeah. No, they're, they're, yeah, that's the way I see it is like England in my head is just Benny Hill. That's kind of how I picture England forever. It's never going to change. And well, it's aged very well then for you. I guess. <laughs> That's just forever what it'll be in my head. All right. So uh, do you remember the very first time that you got in trouble? Yeah. So when I was a little kid, this is going to shock you, but I was really into superheroes. Um, and I was probably about seven years old. And I wait, can I guess, because, can I guess what you, you, you were a Spider-Man guy? I was definitely a Spider-Man guy. Yes. All right. 100%. I know you. Yeah. So I went in my garage one day, um, summer day, and I put on goggles and I made myself a cape and I had my sister had these giant moon boots and I put those on and I had a hood thing that I put up and I got on my little bike and I just went patrolling my neighborhood as a superhero. I love that. And my older sister was at a friend's and saw me and was crazy embarrassed, ran home. My mom found me in her car and told me to get home and take that stuff off right now. And I got in trouble for that. Now, in my opinion, you can look. I mean, I don't have all of the data, but I'm pretty sure that was the safest day of our neighborhood. <laughs> I love it. This was stop yeah. and frisk when Jimmy was yeah. a kid. So, <laughs> so that was my short lived. I think I, I cosplayed before it was cool, you know? Yeah. I mean, there are adults that do that for real right now. There's, I think there's a documentary about this that I need to go and right. find. I think I've seen there it. are like adult humans that consider themselves <laughs> real life superheroes and they go out and they, they dress with masks and everything and they fight crime. <laughs> did you play so the. Yeah, New that, that's my earliest memory there. Did you play the New York Times connections th this morning? I did, yeah. Uh, one of the categories was like parts of a superhero costume. Right. It was like underwear was one of underwear. Them. I thought it was interesting. It was like cape, underwear, yeah. mask, something else. Right. 
And it's okay that we say that because this episode isn't coming out for a couple of weeks. So we're not spoiling it. Oh, yeah. Good call. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler. Uh, yeah. I was trying to think about the first time I really got in trouble and I have trouble coming up with it. But I do remember giving my brother a bloody nose with a. Oh, wow. Remember the old bouncy balls that were not like super high bounce balls, the little ones, but like they were the big uh, pink ones. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We had one of those, but it was E.T. It was gray. It was like silver and it was like an E.T. ball. And I threw okay. it at him and hit his nose and bled. And these this is all the memories I have about this. And I got in trouble for that. So. <laughs> so well, anyway. he should have ducked quicker, right? Yeah. It's his, so he probably did something to make me mad. And that's his fault. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to ask, I'm going to see him in a couple of weeks. I'm going to ask him if he remembers yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you've done very well. Two for two for four. Question five is for all the marbles. And if you get it right, you're welcome back on the podcast anytime. If you get it wrong, you're banned for life. Here's wow. the question. Yeah. I'm never asking you back. Uh, okay. it's, it all rides on this. What it's is so the hard for? <laughs> it's ve I'm very serious about this podcast. As evidenced by the fact that I haven't put out an episode in the last month. Uh, what, what is the best band with the shortest career? This can also be like any recording artist with the shortest career, but who is the best? So like, I'm not talking about necessarily like one hit wonders unless that one hit was really something special. Okay. Uh, well, for me, and it might be kind of a cheat, but I would pick the um, Traveling Wilburys. Oh, super group. Yeah, that's a that's a loophole. Is that a cheat? Uh, maybe, maybe. But here's the thing with Traveling Wilburys. None of those artists individually sounded like that. So I think it's OK that, that that's okay. included. You know what I mean? It wasn't like um, when so and so steps in with the rest of the guys from um, Rage Against the Machine and it just sounds like Rage Against the Machine with a different right. singer. Or Temple or, of the Dog know. where you're like, oh, that's exactly. Just that's just Eddie Vedder. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Traveling Wilburys like could have been its own thing and been successful without probably without the success of individual artists. Maybe. Yeah. And you could I, say I, the I'm same thing you, for okay. the Highwaymen, right? Like the Highwaymen. That's right. Yeah. Although when the Highwaymen are singing, whatever verse it is, it just sounds like that artist's music. You True. know, like, well, this is Chris Christopherson. Um, OK, yeah, that's a good answer. We'll give that to you. We'll say that that's a yes. winner. It means you back. You're loud back. Awesome. I was I, in my head um, at first. I was thinking Beatles. But because they had a long career, but like really compared to some of the acts now, not really like, you know, if well, you, you it's, wait, it's insane to think they were seven, seven years. That's insane. Like the amount of That's output it. in seven years that those guys did is crazy. It is. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And if you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame up in Cleveland, they have Ringo's drum set. And it talks about on there how that was really one of, if not the only drum set that he toured with. Like wow. for a band to not exist long enough for the drummer to have multiple drum sets. And I'm <laughs> sure he did have multiple drum sets, like, you know, for different TV shows and stuff. But like his tour drum set was the one that you think of when you picture Ringo. You know, it's like right. that drum set. Um, but you I was thinking of. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say my I was thinking of Jimi Hendrix. Um, oh, yeah. He only he had like two years of fame. I mean, it That's was crazy. very, yeah. and, and everyone knows the name Jimi Hendrix forever. Right. So yeah, I just want to tell you real quick, my favorite um, Ringo, Ringo story is that, and you may know this, but um, somebody asked John Lennon one time if he thought that Ringo was the best drummer in the world. And his response was, Ringo's not even the best drummer in the Beatles. <laughs> in the Beatles, yes. I, I love it. <laughs> I love it. You, you know what came up on my timeline recently that is a video I had seen before, and I, I want to go back and watch the full thing. But John Lennon was at home and a random like vagrant guy tripping showed up at his door and thought that he was like friends with John Lennon because of the lyrics oh. and because of wow. his trip that he was, you know, the, the, the way that his mind was, the, the state that his mind was in. And he was talking to John about like, you know, you spoke to me and, and told me that we, you know, I was like meant to come here and all these things. And John basically gave him all the time in the world and talked to him and said, listen, man, they're just lyrics. And some of them don't even make sense. It was just the best word that fit in that sentence at the time. And it doesn't mean, <laughs> you know, and, and the guy's like, well, what about this? And he was like, well, first of all, that was Paul singing that line. Uh, and it doesn't mean anything. You know, it's this universal thing that could be true for anyone. And, and I remember when I, I got this annotated, um, oh, cause John Lennon refers to Bob Dylan as like, he's like, Dylan does it too. 
I have this annotated book of all of the Bob Dylan like lyrics of all the songs and it talks about what wow. the references are and and some of them is great like some of it's very like okay he studied but a lot of it there's no meaning to the lines right. at all and we have built meaning into it like oh this is what he definitely was talking about in this and like no it probably just rhymed the best and he couldn't think of anything better and you that's know, depressing bring it, bring it back to paul simon i think that's a lot of it too you know a lot of times it's like if it's just nonsense but i i find meaning in it you know oh absolutely um yeah there were so many so you know mama pajama rolled out of bed and ran right. to the police station <laughs> right you know, like, what, what? why is she mama pajama? We don't know. We don't. It doesn't matter. Shut up. Stop asking questions. It just sounded good at the time. And it sounded so good. Yeah. Anywho. Well, go check out uh, shadowboxlive.org uh, if you want to see, you know, if you're ever in the central Ohio area, you have to make this part of part of what you do. You have to go and see a, a show at Shadowbox. Just trust me on that. Uh, Jimmy's the head writer. He's in a lot of the shows. And uh, he also is making your drinks. If you let him know that you heard him on this podcast, he'll put an extra shot in there for you. Um, you that's probably not true, but who knows? <laughs> you won't know the difference. Uh, so <laughs> also, um, you know, follow his writing. He's are you still are you still doing the X or where where where's the best place to see what you're writing lately? Publicly? Um, probably just on Facebook these days, to be honest with you. Yeah. The X has lost its allure. Yeah. But you are so good at that. X was oh, a great a great spot for you when that was not a hive of scum and villainy. Right. Uh dude, it's so great to have you back on the podcast and and uh for being my first guest on this new season back. This is officially season 8 we're calling it, which is completely awesome. arbitrary, but the thing that's making it different is that uh we're adding the thing where the guest tries to stump me and you did. So, Fantastic. kudos to you on that and our uh what was it? It was it was broccoli that tasted like bubble gum. That's right. Which Confusing I'm gonna, kids all over America. <laughs> immediately going to go learn about. Uh, <laughs> so good to have you back, man, and great to uh, see Michael, you. Michael, it's always a pleasure, and I love hanging out with you, man. <laughs> that is all for this week. Thank you so much to Jimmy Mack for being my guest, and thanks to you for listening. Here's the voice of Colin Blundstone. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. To listen to episodes ad-free and a week early, support us on Patreon. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash Michael Kent. If you learned something just now that you didn't already know, go to the Apple Podcast app and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That helps us a ton, because that's how the algorithm works. I don't know what an algorithm is, but just do it! See you next week for a brand new episode of The Internet Says It's True! The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make this show possible. Sean Brown, Joshua Endress, Dallas Ray, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Jim and Joanne Martin, Mitch and Andrew Joseph Kemplin, and the show's official emperor, Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and all audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17 USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Michael Kent.